on speed entertainment news. There was a surprise and arguably a little shock today when the founder of Tesla Cars and SpaceX and his partner announced the name of their newborn baby girl. They've called her, wait for it, XAEA-12. That's right, she's called XAEA-12. At first, it appears to be a somewhat outlandish name. However, everything needs to be put in context. And when you consider that her father is called Musk, Elon Musk, and her mom is called Grimes, then XAEA-12 doesn't sound quite so weird after all. <laughs> this is Gary Toppenberg for On Speed Entertainment News. Hello, welcome to Gareth Jones on Speed. I'm Gareth, I'm at home in North London. She's Sarah, she's at home in West London. Hello. He's Richard, he's at home in a fashionable part of North London. Hello. And he's Zog in a darkened basement somewhere in West London. How you doing, Z? Hey, all right, thanks, all right. Good to see you all. Yeah, nice to see you all virtually. This is social distancing at its most distant. How are you coping, guys? Richard, how are you coping with lockdown at the moment? <laughs> like everyone else, I suppose. Yeah, it's all right. Not all bad. Just spend the most of the time being slowly trampled on by my children because they seem to find that hilarious to use me as a trampoline. Are you homeschooling? Well, they're quite small, our kids. The smallest one is only two and a bit. But I'm trying to teach her colours because it feels like it's a good thing to do. And how to use a potty, which is um, interesting. And the boy is six, so he needs a bit of schooling, but not too much. It's okay. You can go out in the garden, dig for worms and call that educational. So, you know, it's kind of good. And Richard, I'm surprised to hear that you know how to use a potty. Isn't it a requirement of the teacher that you've got to be able to have that skill yourself? Is that something that you do? No, I just myself all the time but it's fine it gives me <laughs> gives me empathy with a two and a half year old so who uh you know sort of works Zoki, how are you doing down there pretty good i mean being reasonably antisocial, you know where social distancing is less of a strain for me than for a lot of people i think i'm used to doing a lot of my work remotely in any case so my working practices haven't had to change a great deal. You know, there are some novel features of this time. A new hazard I discovered on the road the other day was a peacock. Wow. Not something one comes across uh, on West London roads very often. Any guesses where that came from? It came from the Hurlingham Club. I was driving past the Hurlingham Club and it had escaped from their grounds. So I guess their lockdown isn't very strict at the moment, certainly not for the wildfowl. You better explain what the Hurlingham Club is, Zog. People won't know. It's a rather posh club in West London, leafy grounds. I believe it used to be the home of polo in the UK, as in the stuff with mallets on horses. So it's that kind of place. Not the home of small Volkswagen cars neater than No, the although they used to hold a very fine Concorde d'Elegance there every year, which I went to on a few occasions, which would have some quite spectacular vehicles. I mean, I remember the Alpha Bat cars were there on one occasion, um, you know, all kinds of lovely old race machinery and T. Lawrence's old motorbike, Lawrence of Arabia's motorbike, wow. on another occasion. So that's the Hurlingham Club. And uh, yeah, one of their birds escaped. Sarah, have you seen anything of the world or have you been in complete lockdown there? In Where, where are you, Earl Court or thereabouts? I'm by Notting Hill. I'm near Portobello now. So actually, funnily you should say, Portobello Market is literally buzzing. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. <laughs> really? <laughs> people have just got to the point where they just are getting out and about and they just cannot help themselves. <laughs> yeah, Portobello Road on, say, a Friday, Saturday, it's getting close to business as usual without all the antique markets, but the food markets are out. I mean, people are being very cordial with their behavior. Fruit and veg is obviously an essential item, so all those fruit markets can stay open. It hasn't been too bad. I've not really jumped on public transport anywhere. The furthest I go is sort of Hyde Park. One day I ventured all the way up to Primrose Hill. Very nice. That was quite an experience, but I've been coping. I mean, it's not, not ideal, but I mean, me and the rest of the world don't really think it's ideal anyway. <laughs> and it's far from ideal now into May with still no Formula One. Have you been watching the virtual racing, Sarah? 
I have actually. I saw some of it on the weekend. The Formula One had their very first official esports race and they used the Brazil circuit. I think because the one that was meant to be on this weekend, they actually don't have an e version of this. And it was won by, spoiler alert, does anybody want to know who won? Yeah, come on. I think spoiler alerts are okay. Well, it was Alex Albon won. But Charles Leclerc has been quite prolific with his sort of esports wins but i think sunday was the very very first official f1 so sky sports broadcasted i actually watched it on sky's facebook page and the formula e actually they are also doing e-racing and that is broadcast on the bbc website and their red button and all those things so they are sort of getting their content together but it's time to shine for esports i think and it's been a very valuable tool for Formula One and racing, I think, because even the American series are sort of getting into it and there is an Australian supercars e-racing series now too. So it's sort of been the biggest salvage that they've had, I think. I thought it was interesting actually having the Formula E E e-race and the Formula One event on the same day because it was interesting to compare the two. In the first place, I thought Formula E rather missed a trick on the fan involvement front, which has always been one of their big sort of selling points, you know, fan engagement. And they've had, you know, fan boost and a couple of things like that, which to me are rather gimmicky, overly gimmicky elements of the racing. And I wasn't a big fan of. And they have this format where, as well as the sort of proper Formula E race for the drivers, the regular drivers... There's a second race, a challenge race for influencers, streamers and gamers. But what they didn't do was to put any of those people in the regular race, which I think would have been a really interesting bit of sort of Formula E fan engagement. Yeah, yeah. Which, oddly enough, Formula One is kind of doing, because even though this was, as you say, Sarah, the first official Formula One e-race, following on from the less official events that we've had in the last few weeks. It was still a grid that consisted of roughly half professional drivers and then half cricketers, streamers, gamers, which I thought was kind of odd. If you're going to make it an official F1 event, why isn't it just the professional drivers? The argument about Formula One is, oh, well, you know, Lewis is always in a better car than anybody else. And you want to know, given an even playing field, who are the most skilled drivers, or in this case, who are the most skilled virtual drivers. And you would expect the youngsters to be the ones more adept at adapting to e-racing. But the truth is, all these drivers spend plenty of time in simulators these days they should all be able to adapt Richard how do you feel about seeing pro celebrity e-racing or would you rather see a full F1 grid I don't really mind I mean I assume the celebs will get tanned by the pros because like you say they spend time in the simulator don't they so I don't know I keep it separate I mean you could try everything can't you no one's going to get hurt give it a go and that's the thing it's sort of all bets are off really they can do what they want. I haven't watched any of this, I'm afraid. I, I never know when it's on. Nothing against it particularly. I just never know when it's on. Or even when I do vaguely know it's on, it's usually an inconvenient time. I'm not going to sit and watch a whole race. How long do they go on for anyway? They're not super long, are they? They're running sort of quite short events. Well, the one on Sunday was 36 laps. So, yeah, you're, okay. it's, it's not as long, no. But there is plenty of action. I mean, if a driver crashes, for example, the driver obviously doesn't have any damage or, you know, they can sort of race on and recover themselves a lot easier than if it was a real-life race. They're not sending someone around to beat him up if a driver has a shunt. That's what they should do. They should actually introduce real damage and real jeopardy into the case, whereby, you know, if you do hit the wall as a driver, you've got to punch yourself in the side of the face (laughs) or you've got to put a bit of blue tack on your gamepad. I know they're not using controllers. I know they're using wheels and things to make it more difficult to drive so the car doesn't respond properly. But I have to say, Richard, I'm completely with you on this. I know it's an old complaint. Oh, there's no jeopardy. It doesn't really mean anything like real racing. But I found it really hard to get emotionally connected with the whole e-racing thing. I found it really intriguing just the other day when Lando Norris was on Twitch taking part in an IndyCar race. I thought, oh, this is intriguing. How will an F1 driver fare in an Indy race virtually, if you like? And uh, I like Lando Norris. He's, you know, he's a bit of a keen gamer. He's been a pioneer in esports for F1 for a while. So I thought, I'll watch this. But 
the stream kept locking up every 30 seconds and it wasn't at my end it was at his end or at the twitch end which made it impossible to watch it was just painful and as long as virtual racing has to deal with these sort of problems it's not going to be a mass easy to watch option is it another aspect of this which is interesting is that at the same time that racing that formula one formula e sports car racing are arguably amongst the best sports to adapt to an esports format because basically what you're doing as a racer as a competitor in the esports event is physically the same as what you're doing in the real event which isn't the case if you're playing e-golf or e-tennis or whatever your other sport might be at the same time that there's that element to it so a lot of the skills are really transferable it is still a simulation and i think there's a real sense in which at the same time that we can enjoy these events and i have quite enjoyed these events but at the same time i'm aware that i'm not as fully engaged as I have been with real racing at the same time that we can enjoy these events I think in a way you might not admire somebody quite as much for winning an e-racing event as you might admire a gamer for winning some entirely made up gaming event whether it's you know, an online Fortnite tournament or something else where, where basically you know, the game, the event has been created for that platform for a game platform you're not trying to simulate stuff in the real world and so in a sense there's nothing missing I think so some professional drivers do have a harder time adapting to sim racing because they have more of a problem with stuff like not physically feeling the lack of grip or the fact that the car is just about to go at the rear. And the lack of physical feedback is a problem for them. Whereas if you have, like I say, you know, an online, whether it was, you know, Fortnite or some other online competitive event, th- that stuff, there's nothing missing. As a competitor in those events, you've got the tools that the event was designed for for and you're competing in the arena with all the tools and in the exact world that the event was created for. Do you see what I mean? I think the solution, therefore, might be not to have these lads all connecting in their living rooms, but to hook up the actual simulator that each of these teams have got in their headquarters, which does have, I would imagine, a three-axis movement to it and give the drivers that sense of the back end breaking away. That's what they should be doing. That's not a bad idea. Yeah. Richard, you'd agree with me that I think one of the main reasons we watch Formula One it's not just the racing, it's about the backstory and the personality and the ridiculous things that happen, isn't it? Yeah, I guess so. I suppose, well, those things still go on, don't they? On this racing, sorry, because I haven't seen any of it, they're not talking to each other then like gamers would. They're not allowed to speak to each other during the race. Oh, you mean like talk to their radio or whichever, their team, is that what you mean? In this esports race on Sunday night, I think there was cameras that would throw to their virtual cockpit. Yeah, and they're just on their own. So, yeah, they don't have a team radio or anything. They're sort of purely making their own decisions. So I guess it is the skill of the driver. But so to your point, at the beginning of all this e-racing, there was like a specialist e-racer, esports F1 driver. So you know how they have their esports F1 drivers anyway, separate to the actual real life F1. Yep. One of the Alfa Romeo esports drivers, he was racing against all of them and he was beating Lando Norris, Nico Hulkenberg, Stoffel Van Dorn and probably because he is a specialist in esports racing so he built those skills as an esports racing. Now put him into a real life Formula 1 car, he'd be probably battle or be rather inexperienced but it is a specialty I think being like a gamer of a driver. Lando Norris was taking it very seriously in yeah. that IndyCar race which I tried to watch as long as I could he had his race engineer helping him out spotting the cars around him as though it was a real race and Lando made the statement recently that gaming has become more scientific that was the term he used and he was taking it very very seriously indeed and it was nice because we did get Richard a little bit of personality we saw Lando sitting in his chair in his living room there was a third view camera and we heard the dialogue that he was having with his race engineer and that helped involve involvement with the viewer at home I think but even so I wish I really wish I could get excited by it because I believe in simulation I believe in motor racing and I want this to work for me but 
I am struggling. Am I alone? No, I, I think not. No. I don't think you're alone, but I think there are a lot of gamers that do watch esports. I ended up in Germany earlier this year. Oh, no, it was last year. And I did a story on esports. And it was all about gamers that play things like Fortnite professionally. And there is a huge mass audience. They get millions of people across the world watching it on Twitch and all these different streaming channels. Like it's a, it's a huge market and there are people out there that get excited about it. So in these lockdown times, I think I've spent so much time playing Call of Duty mobile that I must be at a semi-pro level by now at least. Right. There must be some sort of gaming game for poker players is there. So I can imagine you'd be involved in that one too. <laughs> yeah, well, well, yeah, no, <laughs> that's kind of a long story, <laughs> but long story short i used to play a fair bit more online poker than i have in the last four or five years i've played a lot more in the last few weeks but honestly what i've mostly been doing is playing an online home game so whereas the online poker that i used to play was with anonymous players from anywhere in the world the games that i've mostly been playing in the last few weeks have been games with players that i know from playing in the real world people i've played real world poker with before at the sort of home games and we're playing on a regular online poker platform poker stars which lets you set up like a private club and so you set up a, you basically set up a club for you and your mates and you invite them to a game and you have a private tournament and then we have a zoom chat session going on wow and it's a lot of fun i'm having a great time but i'm losing my shirt i've got to tell you that is one tough game it's clear to me then zog that you're filling the hole left by formula one with non-car related stuff you know i've been making videos here for my Friday live stream for songs that I've done on Gareth Jones on Speed. So I'm filling my car need that way. Richard, I know you've finished writing your book now. How are you getting your car fixed with the absence of Formula One? I did go out in the car the other day because I had the excuse of taking some old furniture to a homeless shelter up the road from us. And I took some old chairs up there that were still in good nick and dropped those off. And it was just nice to go for a couple of miles up the road. But apart from that, there's not really a lot you can do, I guess. It's interesting that we're all fairly F1 obsessed. You know, we've had a habit, certainly, of watching Formula One for a large part of our lives. And now that it's taken away from us... Well, none of us are that particularly bothered, or are we? We'd like it to come back, but we seem to be coping all right, despite its absence. I think you're right there. I think a lot of people have realised that life does carry on, even if they can't go to bars and clubs and restaurants or watch their favourite sport, but at the cost of obviously hemorrhaging income and budgets and things like that. But there is a way to cope, you know family time etc although i'm no expert <laughs> yeah we're quite adaptable creatures but yeah, yeah there's, no. there's a lot more to life than f1 and motor racing i must have i felt a bit of a yearning to make some f1 models really? uh, yeah i think maybe i may have to make a couple of those rather nice tamiya either 120th or 112th scale f1 kits i think that you've built one or two of those in your time haven't you gareth i have over the years yeah a long 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 time since i've done any tamia modeling but at the moment what i most want to do is to build a model of lunar cod it's technically a car it's a lunar rover i know but yeah the russian lunar rover yeah 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 from the 1970s when you know cars were cool i bet real space models will have one there probably isn't an airfix or a rebel or a tamia kit because it's quite an obscure one but i bet real space models models would have one there are paper plans online where you can build your own from paper and cocktail sticks and stuff like that and i think that would fill in more time for me until the grand prix return which is what we will discuss next on gareth jones on speed There was some sad news this week as we learned of the death of florian schneider one of the founder members of Kraftwerk. Kraftwerk were hugely influential, so I thought I'd put a piece of electronic music in the show today. Here's a song in the style of John Fox from Ultravox and Gary Newman, two artists who we would never have had if it wasn't for Kraftwerk. My version, of course, is John Vox and Barry Newman, and this is a song about the dangers of buying 1980s Austin Rover cars with synthesized voices on board on eBay. It's called The Car That Wasn't There. Thank you. 
I got a sense in the last couple of days that the road back to the universe of normality might just be emerging. I heard in the last couple of days that Bentley and Rolls-Royce had both reopened their factories, that Jaguar Land Rover were focusing on how they're going to restart production, that Ferrari had opened up their factory in Maranello after the end of the lockdown in Italy, and Ross Braun was making statements about how Formula One will actually return. Have you guys been following these bits of news emerging? Yeah, I've seen Ross Braun's announcement. He's thinking of a bubble of isolation plan. What's also called as some sort of biosphere. They're wanting to kick off the Formula One in July, apparently, with two races in Austria and two races in Silverstone. But Austria in particular, because apparently the actual racetrack is very close to a whole lot of hotels and things like that, and the airport, so they can sort of fly in and all the sort of media and drivers and the teams can sort of stay in a little bubble. But then the rules are that they have to isolate within their own little bubbles so teams won't be able to mix so they have their own little isolation bands you know so only McLaren can mix with McLaren and things like that and then they'll test everybody before they step onto the paddock and then every couple of days on the paddock so I think they're going to do everything they can to get it going particularly from what I'm reading anyway is that it's costing them a lot of money (laughs) not to be racing with all their broadcast rights deals and things like that it appears that there will be two races in Austria on the 5th of July um, and the 12th of July and then another two races in Silverstone for the last two weekends of July. So it will be all go, apparently. Just in time for my birthday on the 5th of July, the return of Formula One. Boy, am I going to celebrate. It's going to be weird, though. Richard, will you watch a race where there's no crowd there in the real world watching it? I honestly don't think this is going to happen. I think it's it's wishful thinking. If you look at what's countries are now saying ireland new zealand places like that are talking about not permitting anyone to travel in and out of the country i know new zealand is talking to australia about creating some sort of bubble between the two of them so you can travel between those two nations but nowhere else and they'll have no one from outside it's only eight weeks or so isn't it till that proposed austrian weekend if you were the austrian government do you honestly want people coming from at least two countries i mean it's going to be what italy i guess switzerland as well and the uk and then whether i don't know has have to bring people from the us particularly the us where it seems like you know this whole thing is still far from under control are you honestly going to say yeah that's fine you can all come in i just think it's unthinkable at the moment and i don't think the british government would be any keener to do it in 10 11 weeks the proposals that ross braun talked about have clearly been thought through and they seem to be a pretty sensible reasonable way of approaching the problem of how do you restart some kind of racing in the kind of circumstances that we're likely to find ourselves in in a couple of months but yeah Richard you're absolutely right the travel side of it is a big question mark the idea of kind of pre-screening a relatively small group of people who you then put effectively in their own quarantine bubble to do an activity for a certain period of time seems to be a, a not unreasonable way to approach this but if you can't travel internationally that kind of scotches it all one of the reasons why the idea of a Silverstone doubleheader seems a little bit more practical than other ideas is that so many teams so many people are based in the UK so there's less of an issue around the travel there but would travel regulations allow whole teams of people whole F1 teams and their equipment to come from Italy to the UK don't know Mm. well also what are you going to do you drive you're driving the trucks across Italy France, I don't know if you touched on any other country, depends which way you went. It seems like particularly the way that Italy suffered with this, and given what we do know about COVID-19 and how long it can incubate for with no presentable evidence, then it just feels like, apart from anything else, it just feels stupid. It's like it's only a sport. I know people's jobs are at stake here, but jobs versus lives, it's a tricky one. Lives win, and it just seems like this is just to drive some cars around in circles. If you weren't into F1, you'd just go, you people are out of your frigging minds. Grow up. So I think they've got to be quite careful about that as well from a PR point of view, yeah. 
It's just why? What's the point? It all sounds so in these circumstances where you know thousands of people are dying every day. It just feels completely irrelevant and stupid. It's kind of in bad taste at the best, in a sense. You know. It's only come about, I think, because Dieter Mertesisch owns the Red Bull Ring in Austria. That he's sort of an internal part of Formula One and has made this possible. But they're talking about there being no journalists. If it happens, and maybe I'm with you, Richard, that it probably won't happen because of travel restrictions. And whether it should happen or not is a very valid point. But they're talking about doing it with no journalists. It's a purely digital event. So does that mean they'll shoot it themselves? There won't be any TV crews there? What? You'd have to think there'd be a host broadcaster. But I also read that there wouldn't be any motorhomes. So that might rule out sort of trucks driving across Europe. But yeah, I don't know. Even though it is a bit crazy bringing in all these foreigners with the travel restrictions, my understanding is that Ross Braun is trying to make the point that they're going to make a huge effort to keep these people in their bubbles. So they wouldn't actually go outside of their isolation bubbles and they'd stay in close proximity to each other and not experience expose themselves to the general public so it wouldn't hopefully spread throughout the country if anybody did have it but I mean yeah it's a tough one it is a tough one as you say if you have a kind of a semi-quarantined isolated group of people the the biosphere that John Todd is talking about I mean yes you know you can eliminate the risk of them spreading anything to the wider public by not having anyone else there for them to interact with by having this completely behind closed doors, you know, not having the press there, not having the public there and plus this is a pre-screened group of people. The point about asymptomatic transmission, Richard which you make is a good one. I don't know quite how reliably you can say this person is definitely not going to be contagious on the basis of a test and a seven day waiting period or whatever it might be. But that does still leave the practical issue of travel. Can enough of the people that you need to put this event together in the real world travel to where that event is going to happen? Because Formula One shouldn't be getting any special treatment from governments and airlines and regulators in terms of whether people are allowed to travel. They've got to deal with the world as it is, as the rest of us do. And if that means that a significant number of people cannot travel to Austria or to Silverstone to make the event happen, then, yeah, it can't happen. Are they doing it out of sheer desperation and what I mean is they're not necessarily doing it for the audience they're doing it for the teams themselves because if the teams don't have some sort of revenue stream or perhaps Formula 1 gets a revenue stream itself in the next three to six months some of them are going to go bankrupt and we'll lose any sort of future for Formula One? Well, I think there's a few things going on there. I think definitely some of the teams will be in jeopardy. But also, I think for it to be a legitimate season, you have to have at least six races. I think that's an FIA rule, isn't it? So that's why the Formula E are in trouble because they need to get up to seven races. And the race in July has been cancelled in New York, which is usually their last race of the season. And without that race, it'll nullify the whole season, unfortunately, for Formula E. And they're just going to have to focus on next year. So so there's that. Yeah, obviously teams going bust and keeping broadcasters happy, I think, too. I think there's probably a few things going on. But mind you, I don't think Formula One's any more special than the other sports because I did read this morning that following the government making their announcement on what the unlockdown plan is on the 10th of May, there's plans for all the Premier League people are meeting to try and get the Premier League going on the 11th of May. So I think every sport is pretty desperate to get it all back on board but also drivers and players and you know athletes they're going to have their own issues and their own beliefs about it too you know should they be participating or should they not be so i think it's a quite a few things going on <laughs> it, it seems to me it's a smart thing to do to come up with a plan for how you might get racing going again i don't think there's anything wrong with that as long as you do that in the knowledge that it might not happen. You know, that these are kind of contingencies. These are possibilities. These are proposals. You mentioned the Premier League. I suspect that it's a lot easier to get a domestic football league going again than it is an international racing series for very obvious reasons. But yeah, as you say, if other sport is restarting and if Formula One can come up with a way of doing it that works within the necessary limitations that we're going to have to deal with, the necessary safeguards, then good. That's a good thing. What would we do if we were in charge of Formula One? What would I do? I would 
try and find some way of connecting the simulators and have some real, you know, proper Formula One in the virtual environment. Or, I don't know, get each of the drivers to run laps around their own little map of a circuit in their garden <laughs> and run those simultaneously. I can't think there's any possibility that any of the teams would even dream of somehow cheating their software or coming up with some sort of <laughs> slightly dodgy workarounds to game the system there. No possibility of that at all. Oh, wouldn't that be exciting? Wouldn't it be great if Flavio was in charge of the software for the Renault team at the moment? Oh, how he could be imaginative. i tell you what has been entertaining, though. Some of the drivers have been posting all of their antics and home entertainment on their social media channels. So they're doing all these challenges and things like that to sort of keep them occupied while they're not, in fact, travelling the world racing. I don't know if anyone saw the parkour challenge by Daniel Ricciardo. No, what's this? I miss this completely. It went viral. So every single motorsport website, magazine, or they all put it on their website. They ripped it off his Instagram story. So I think he's good friends with this snowboarder that's based in Melbourne, another Australian guy. He's a Red Bull Scotty James is his name and they do these online challenges so you know parkour where you have to get from one location to the other and you you, you jump over like buildings and things like that and you know parkour athletes they do it and they look obviously like athletes are doing flips and they land properly and anyway Daniel and this Scotty James did this it was very funny I that's the funniest thing I've seen on the internet in a long time and they just did this challenge that you know involved going from one point of their house to another point but they were just the real class larrikins indoor parkour indoor parkour but they would go from inside to outside yeah I would recommend chasing down that footage and having a look at it if you want to have a laugh I was properly laughing but I mean I think there's lots of I think Lando Norris is into all that kind of stuff as well. So the the off-the-track entertainment, you know, hasn't been too bad. (laughs) What would you suggest, Richard? What should they do? That's the thing. It's an unprecedented situation, isn't it? I think there isn't the right thing to do. But I do also think, you know, if, if Formula One gets some kind of dispensation to start doing races again, what kind of example it's setting if we're all still being told that we have to be on lockdown and you already get the sense that people are a bit bored and restless of that and are starting to be a little bit more cavalier and that is how we're going to get a horrible second wave of people dying in large numbers. So we've got to be a bit sensible about it and if you're then going, but hang on a minute, Lewis Hamilton gets to go to Austria for the weekend. I mean, it's sort of, it just sets, sorry, my children are killing each other downstairs. Um <laughs> You can probably hear that. Yes. I'll lock them in the cupboard afterwards. So what can you reasonably do? But the thing is, what you can't do is attempt to sort of present yourself or even act as if you are above the rules because the rules are there for a reason and it's to stop your grandmother dying primarily when i say that if formula one can get back to some kind of racing that's a good thing i'm saying that with the caveat that that's only in the context that they're working within the same kind of restrictions and let's say contact tracing and testing that allows the rest of the world to open up a bit. If you look at what's happened in New Zealand, for example, which has been very successful in dealing with COVID-19, I think they've had no new cases for a little while now. But they've very early on had a combination of lockdown and then testing and contact tracing, which very effectively eliminated COVID-19 from the New Zealand population. But you need to be able to do a lot of testing and contact tracing for that to work. And that's clearly nowhere near happening in the UK certainly in the rest of Europe in the US we're a long way from that are you saying that it's completely irresponsible Richard do you think they should just give up and wait until next year I'm not saying it's, it's irresponsible as much as I think they just have to be careful and apart from anything else they have to abide by the rules that the rest of us do to to some degree so you know one of the reasons I guess Zog, that New Zealand's been very successful in containing this is because well, there's lots of things, isn't there? Fairly low population density and all that, but also because their lockdown was incredibly severe. I was just talking to an old university mate of mine who lives in New Zealand the other night, and, yeah, they have just come out of the highest level of lockdown they've had, and they're now in a more relaxed state, but their more relaxed state is as severe as it is here. Our highest level of lockdown so far is their relaxed state, so, you know, they've been pretty sort of strong on just getting everyone to stay home which you can't do if you're then saying, hey, come to work effectively to F1 mechanics. And I suppose the point is, you know, there's lots of people who do still have to go to work, including our medical personnel, but they're doing it for a very good reason. And the people who deliver groceries to you are doing it for a good reason. And the people who are keeping, you know, the electricity running and all that stuff, they're doing it for a good reason. Cars driving around in circles, not a good reason. 
Yeah, much as we love it, it's not essential. Well, they do talk about it in terms of mental health, don't they? They talk about giving the people a distraction. Give them something to look forward to, something to cheer them up. It's very important. Haven't they heard of Netflix? You know... (laughs) I was going to say, I mean, come on, it's like we live in an age of unprecedented access to a, a huge amounts of historical media of all kinds. If you can't find something to entertain you in this lockdown, then you basically are a moron and you should have a look at yourself, OK? You do not need Formula One. You just go and find something to watch on Netflix. You can get old races. There are loads of them on YouTube or old rallying. I mean, there's so much stuff to watch and it's wonderful. Just go and watch that. My new obsession is Crazy Ex-Girlfriend on Amazon. I'm still boycotting Netflix, by the way. So having plugged Netflix a moment ago, (laughs) I am still boycotting. But yeah, Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, fantastic show. No, I've actually been watching quite a few films, to be fair. (laughs) I've found ways to entertain myself. (laughs) But I actually, the BBC there now, they're completely reprogrammed programming their schedule because obviously there's no sport but they're rerunning all the greatest historical games ever so they're just going to replay them yeah i watched some old football the other night which i'm not even into football but they played an amazing game one interesting thing that's emerged in the culture recently of course is the collective watch along whether it's a watch and tweet along with a film a classic movie 7 p.m on thursday night or whatever it is or a race or collective album listening you know there, there's yeah. uh, we're getting in you know, a collective album listening and tweet alongs oh that's fantastic so, uh, tim burgess's listen along thing is, um, on twitter yes absolute legend i can't believe how many good people he's now getting to just talk about their greatest albums it's fantastic I wish I had more time to be able to do it. Is it too early for an on-speed listen-along where we put out an old episode and give it a sort of a director's commentary? Oh, I remember when Zog said this. Here he is saying it now. I... <laughs> I'm not sure that would work, are you? I'm not sure any of us would remember quite well enough the fiddling small details uh, of episode production. But uh, Yeah, I'm a little bit miffed that I missed the Tim Burgess listen-along tweet-along to Architecture and Morality a couple of weeks ago, which I had prior notice of, and I just completely forgot it was happening. I'm still a little bit miffed. Hang on, Architecture and Morality, is that a Heaven 17 album, or is it a documentary about architecture... And morality you're talking about. OMD, dude. OMD. Is it OMD? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. My knowledge of OMD is not as extensive as yours. Come on. And trivia fans, the title Architecture Morality was suggested to them by Martha, Martha Laidley of Martha and the Muffins. Huh. Great record. Great Peter Savile cover. I think I'll pull this conversation back to Formula One now. <laughs> Can I ask, have any of you three watched, I know you won't have Zog, but have any of you three watched Strive to Survive, the Series 2? Yeah, I've watched it. Uh, I think it's good, and I think it's good for the sport. And I think it served its purpose in terms of, I guess, converting the sort of casual fan to maybe becoming a bit more of a fan to see what really goes on behind closed doors. I think it's really good. Obviously, it's going to be difficult for them to shoot another one this season, but I wouldn't surprise if it does get another series. And it's an original Netflix series, so I think they've done quite well there. There's quite a few sports documentaries that are original Netflix series. But I think it was good. And I did watch it when it first came out. So um, off the top of my head, I can't tell you my favourite story. But Gunther Stein is always a favourite, isn't he? Richard, have you seen Drive to Survive, the series too? I'm about three apps in. I'm just trying to find time to watch it. But can't watch it with the children because of Gunther Steiner. <laughs> yeah, that is an issue. Can't watch it with most adults because of Gunther Steiner. His language levels. I've watched the first couple of episodes. It felt like watching a montage for me. I was waiting for it just to settle down and relax it was all a bit overpackaged and intense and i think it improves by episode three you get much more of a real story rather than a montage of the story is that your experience yeah i think what they did is they've sort of themed each episode around one particular team and that's been quite clever in the edit i think because they've managed to pull together or sort of stream in storylines that will focus on one episode so they move from sort of a reno episode then they go to a red bull episode and they sort of look towards the most prolific event of the season that that particular team did so one of the episodes was based around that huge accident when the formula 2 driver passed away and they sort of covered that then there was a Haas team episode then there was a red bull episode and you could see the way they went through the season or they probably got all their rushes together at the end of the season and they figured how they put the edit together so it was quite well thought out i think as a post producer of the series but i suppose that's my producer director experience coming in there (laughs) 
<laughs> with my opinion on how they put it together, which I, I cannot watch documentaries or films without actually <laughs> giving it a bit of a critique. Yeah, yeah. It's the same for any of us who work in television. You can't always get lost in the narrative. You see how they've made the bloody thing. It's my big problem. I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Richard, I know that Zog's boycotting Netflix because he doesn't believe in the... What's he called? Goo? That stupid... Goop Lab. Goop Lab, yeah. I boycotted. I dropped my subscription because they'd produced Goop Lab and I so object to promoting that ridiculous bull Yeah. Which is particularly appropriate in the killer era we are right now, the particular moment we are now. We need a lot less of that alternative health bollocks. Correct. I will say, though, that one of the last things I saw on Netflix was Uppity, the documentary about Willie T. Ribs. Right, I've missed this as well. Which I thoroughly recommend. Very fine film. <laughs> Willie T. Ribs is a black American racing driver notable for being first black driver in NASCAR, for example. A very promising driver whose career was undoubtedly affected by racism in the US. He was supported along the way by Paul Newman and he's a really talented, charismatic, interesting Interesting guy and Uppity tells his story very well. Also worth mentioning, he tested, I think, a Formula One car. He did try out for Formula One in the 70s, but wasn't picked up, which, as I recall, was basically a sponsorship issue. I don't think there was any suggestion there that there was a racist element to it. Other drivers had better sponsorship backing them up. Very fine film about a fascinating, very talented American race driver who may not be familiar to everyone in the UK, but highly recommended. I'll make sure I watch that. Thanks, Zog. That's it for now. You've been listening to Gareth Jones on Speed. He was Zog. Goodbye. She was Sarah. Goodbye. He was Richard. Goodbye. And I was Gareth. Don't forget, if you like the sound of our voices, there's plenty more to be had. Richard has a podcast now with Johnny Smith, Car Pervert. Make sure you subscribe to Sniff and Smith, the audio podcast. And why not join me for my regular Friday night, 9pm lockdown live stream. Live video available on my YouTube channel or on my official Gareth Gaztop Jones Facebook page. See ya! To send us an email, see pictures, get song lyrics, join our Facebook fan site, follow us on Twitter, or to find out about sponsorship opportunities, go to garethjones.tv. Gareth Jones on Speed is made in London by Whizbang. The car net wasn't there. The car net wasn't there.